We're talking about bizarre garden hacks that are proved by science to actually make a difference in your garden. Some of these are, they're unhinged. Unhinged, but I'm gonna go in and tell you what the hack is and then why it works and how you may choose to use this in your garden. We're not talking eggshells and coffee grounds and Epsom salt. If you're on this channel long enough, you know that's all kind of <coughs> bullshit, but these ones are real. Number one is bean leaves. Now, more specifically, bush bean leaves. Now I did a, a short on this, um, and I did a post on Instagram about this, but essentially the bottoms of bean leaves are sticky. And this stickiness is actually got nothing to do with juices. It has everything to do, juices, oh my God, everything to do with trichomes. So we've talked about trichomes from the standpoint of the ability to release smells to attract certain things, or from the perspective of using trichomes to shade a plant from intense sun. Those are kind of the common ways that trichomes help plants. One way that trichomes help plants that people don't actually realize is as a, a, a defense mechanism that is also kind of medieval-like. And that is because bush bean leaves catch gnats. And if you ever look at the bottom of a bush bean leaf, you will see bugs kind of plastered up against the leaf. And it's because they went through a medieval torture session where they got impaled on the bottom of the trichomes. And you can use bean leaves all over your garden. You can intersperse them between just your regular plants, or you can actually use them inside with your house plants and they will help to take out your fungus gnats. Now, they are particularly good and even better than sticky traps because the canopy of the bean actually sits over top of the soil surface and gnats, if you did not know, are soil born problem. So when those bugs hatch, when they go to lay, they gotta get to the soil and then they gotta get out. So eventually, they get caught in the canopy, which ultimately helps you get rid of your gnat problem a little bit faster. Plus you get some free beans to eat at the end of it because those are very easy plants actually to grow indoors. They do just fine. Number two is aspirin. I did a video on this probably two, three years ago at this point, I can't quite remember, but what's in there is salicylic acid. Willow does have salicylic acid in it. It has aspirin, if you will. And it's actually medicinally has been used that way for hundreds of years. However, Willow's not as concentrated as like your, your rolled school aspirin that you go and you buy from the store. If you're transplanting, if you're doing cuttings, if you have a plant that you know is really stressed out for some reason, whether that be from damage to the leaves, um, damage to the roots, disease, pests, you name it, drought even, the use of salicylic acid helps that plant overcome both biotic and abiotic factors. So biotic means living factors like a fungal issue or a pest. Abiotic is mechanical, so wind damage, transplant damage, that sort of thing. And it essentially helps that plant to get through a stressful period of time. So the time to use salicylic acid or aspirin, if you chose to, would actually be in your watering containers. Just one pill per watering container. You can change that dosage. There's a ton of different ways to do this but I just do one pill and a regular watering can, the one that I talked about in the plastic video that's gonna kill me one day, yeah, that one, you're good to go. Put that on your plants and you're off to the races. Aspirin is definitely one you want to try. Thigmotropism. I know, you're like, I'm leaving now, but before you leave, that is actually another hack. And that is a really big word for touch or movement causing the plant to have some sort of response to the touch or the movement. You can utilize figmotropism by just touch. You can use this through fans. So if you put a fan on your seedlings, it is known for a fact that it will cause the plant to respond and it will make them stronger, more resistant to transplant shock and just better plants. You can use 
not a fan and actually just use a brush of some sort. So a dustpan brush, um, just a little one kind of brushing the tops of the plants is another form of theotropism that will help you. Now, you're probably thinking, well, why do I need a brush? Why can't I just touch my plant? And that is because the hack that's really not a hack is that our hands are not great for plants. I, that's a crazy rule because I, I grow plants all the time and it's not good for them. It comes down to a, a number of different factors, but oftentimes it's salts, it's oils, and even just the stomata on the bottoms of the leaves, there's some on the surface, uh, when those are touched by human hands, they tend to collapse. Now some plants are, you know, do better with it than others, but just general rule is don't touch. Next one is a perched water table. So this one actually came up in the public speaking engagement. It's, it's really not that fancy. It was it was me basically torturing people for two hours. However, it came up in that talk where someone had mentioned that they heard that layering of soil can cause, or just debris, can cause water problems. And those water problems can translate into, tra bleh, translate into sick or plants that aren't performing well. And that is totally true. But the perch water table concept doesn't just jive with soil layers. It actually jives with house plants, raised beds, in-ground beds, you name it. So essentially what the idea here is that if you have a layer of something, say it's compost, say it's mulch, say it's whatever, the water will move through that layer to the next layer. Now, once it hits the next layer, it actually runs horizontally for a period of time until saturation points are met within that next layer, depending on the material that's there. So if it's a clay material, it's more difficult. If it's a sand material, it still has troubles just going down. It will go sideways. If it's a rock layer, so if you put rocks into the bottom of a, a pot, or if you use uh, pool noodles, for example, I've used those in the past, packing peanuts in the bottom of like a giant uh, container that you don't want to fill for, with soil because A, who needs to be in a strongman competition in their life? I don't. Secondly, who has that much money to buy soil? Seriously. You can use the packing peanuts, put potting soil on top of that, the packing peanuts won't necessarily allow that water to just flow through. And I know you're probably thinking, well, Ashley, that has like more porosity. It has more macro porosity than that of which the potting soil would have. Perched water tables don't care about soil porosity. It holds on to water. So if you're doing like a hogaculture setup, if you're doing a raised bed where you're doing plant debris on the bottom and then potting soil or soil on top, Every time you have a transition, you have a chance for a perched water table. Now, why this is not great for plants is because if your rhizosphere, your root zone is actually sitting in that perched water table section, this entire area where your roots are sitting is pure water. So it is anaerobic, meaning does not have oxygen, which causes a whole host of issues. Uh, namely root rot, which is the famous form of lack of oxygen effects. So check out your root depth, figure out your root depth for what crop you intend to put in that area, and then make sure that your soil is at least two inches deeper than that of which your, your roots grow. If you are transplanting a bush, a tree, whatever, transplanting tomatoes outdoors, and you put a bunch of compost or manure in the hole, the entire area that the compost is sitting in is literally a perch water table. Way to avoid that is to dig your hole twice the size of your root ball, yes, but to actually mix the compost, your potting soil, all that sort of stuff up with the ground around it outside of that. So that homogenous is always the goal. Okay, so this one is probably my favorite and it is moisture. More specifically, soil moisture. Soil moisture is one of your greatest defenses 
against compaction. It can also be one of your greatest downfalls if we're being totally honest. The reason for this is because soil that has water in it has a slipping and a sliding effect. And in order for that soil to compact, you need to actually remove the water from that system. So if you have a, a ball of clay or loam or whatever in your, in your hand and it has water in it and you squeeze it and all that water comes out, where do you think it come, came from? Water was stored inside of the pores and the pores were, are essentially spaces that are keeping the particles away from each other. Makes sense. If it's dry, there's nothing to keep the particles away from each other other than air. And let's face it, air is very movable in most cases. What you can do is you can keep your moisture up. The way you would do this isn't necessarily by watering more. What you're looking for is mulches and you know compost layers, something that helps retain the moisture and ultimately reduces the rates of evapotranspiration, which simply means the effects of the sun and the wind and heat to an extent are mitigated. I was not a mulcher even though I knew the benefits were there until I started mulching and I am just obsessed with it now, seriously. I recommend it to everybody, but there's a number of different things mulch can do and I could do a whole video literally just on mulch and how to make a mulch work because there are mulches out there that are great and they don't work the way that they should. If you have mulch on top of your soil, it actually shades your soil. It cools your soil down. Not only does this help your plant roots, because plant roots very rarely like to get hot. There's some that do, but most do not. And secondly, it helps retain moisture. What I will say, a big what I will say, and please listen to this. If your soil is moist and you're trying to achieve this and you're trying to avoid soil that looks like this, when people see this, they're like, it's compacted. Yes, it is because you there's no moisture there. If you just watered it, it would like rehydrate. If you have that issue, just add water. It's like those dinos those growing dinosaurs in the pill. I digress. What can happen when everything's hydrated, if you walk across this, it will cause compaction. And this is true for any soil. I don't care if you till, I don't care if you don't till. If you walk on wet soil, you're going to compact it. The next one works for houseplants, seedlings, and perennials, and annuals, you name it. It's like a universal truth for all plants. And that is exposing your plants to bugs. Now, when I say bugs, I mean either dead ones or the exoskeletons of ones or their feces. Sounds disgusting, I know, but incredibly effective. Enough bug debris to make your plant think it's actually exposed to a pest. You can also do this with a fly trap or a wasp trap. Hatch everything in sugar water and blend it up. I, that sounds gross when I say that out loud, but then I realize I've done it and I'm like, I'm crazy. I am nuts. But anyways, and then actually put it into your soil system, into your potting soil, triggering kind of like a, 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 a that. I don't want to say it because YouTube will get very mad at me. Yeah, that is it. You're literally doing that to your plant when you do this. The other option is to get exoskeletons. So this is going to drive people insane, but there's chitin, chitin. People, people hate the way I pronounce that. That in and of itself can also cause the same reaction. Okay, this one I did a whole video on years ago. I'll put it here, but no, that is not urine. That is whey. <laughs> so you can get whey in a number of different ways. I discussed in the video how I got that jar away. You can get them from that kefir jewel stuff. The kefir, if you just let it sit, is incredibly effective at destroying powdery mildew. When I say this, um, there are studies that were done specifically on cucumbers and squash. And when I say squash, zucchini is what I was tested on because scientists aren't made of money. So what they did is they plant cucumbers and zucchinis. They expose them to powdery mildew and, and then they took the whey 
uh, product and they exposed some plants to it twice a week and they exposed other plants to it once a week. So the concentrations that they used were water, straight water was the control, so 0%. Then they used 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30% intervals. So whey was 25% of the mixture, the other portion of the mixture was water. Would apply the powdery mildew, just spray it on the way you would do any sort of um, spraying application. What they noticed was there was no difference between once a week and twice a week, regardless of the concentration. The once a week was just as effective as the twice a week, which is like a very easy way to be able to control this stuff. So the concentration that worked for the cucumbers, and that was a higher dose. So it's the 25 to 30% way to water ratio applied once a week. Despite the fact that it needed higher concentration, the twice a week application did not do much. Did it eliminate powdery mildew? No, you're never gonna eliminate it. But it did decrease the maturation and the infection, if you will. And it slowed it down. This one says, you know, from 0.45 to 0.75, so that is like, it's quite, they're slowing the rate a lot, a lot. And that may be enough to just get your plants through fruiting, flowering, and to the tail end of harvest, and you're, you're done, which may be all you need. What they did mention is that every single ratio, so long as there was whey, actually decreased the progression of powdery mildew regardless of, again, the concentration or the frequency of application only being once or twice a week. What they do mention though, is that above 30% whey protein to water ratio, and they, they tended to see phytotoxicity being exhibited. So phytotoxicity is, um, what we see when we do like a bioassays test that I spoke about for testing our compost, for example, herbicides. And so phytotoxicity is, is a term that we use to describe a plant that has been inhibited in some way through exposure to something. Very broad terms, um, but it's a way to describe that something is damaging the plant. And in the case of whey, it was over that 30% mark. Now this is newer science there like this article that i'm reading right now um was published in 2008 and this is probably one of the older ones and what they are using in this is like a pure whey formula and if you're using anything that i mentioned in this video it's very unlikely that that water whey portion is going to be 100% whey. So if you just get that like 25%, 30%, 50% and sometimes try it on a spot test, but I think you'd probably be just okay. That may be all you need to get the results that you, you want in regards to powdery mildew suppression. So I, I wouldn't really, really worry about over applying unless you've got access to like pure whey. Uh, by volume, and then you you would want to be careful. If you have any crazy hacks that you want to leave down below, please do. Geek crew, stay geeky. So yeah, 